In this video, we're going to go over the continuous charge distribution sections uh, and drives or quickly go over some, some important results from these sections. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes and motivate this definition. Like, why do we care about this thing, lambda? Uh, what is it? Why do we care about it? By the way, the, the uh, names for these things, these are Greek letters. That is not eta. <laughs> that is lambda, L-A-M-B-D-A, -A -A. Uh, this like scorpion looking thing. Uh, and then the other one is called eta, just Greek letters that we're going to use for charge density. Um, OK, so imagine you had a bunch of plus charges. So each of these are, are plus charges Q. And you wanted to know what the electric field was right here. Uh, well, you could just sum them up, right? It's the sum of K times Q sub I. Like we're going to label them I equals 1, I equals 2, uh, et cetera. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, divided by the distance that that charge is away from the uh, point of interest squared. This would be the total electric field E at P equal to this. Uh, the problem is um, what happens if you don't have a bunch of, well, you can think of it two ways. One, one is what if you have an infinite number of charges? So like the world around us is 10 to the 23 charges. So we can't really do 10 to the 23 terms in this sum. Um, and actually, there's so many charges that it doesn't even, it's not even nice to think of them as point charges at a certain point. Like if you had a rod and it was charged, it just makes sense that the, the charge has like, is, the charge is smeared out evenly over the rod. You know, if you, if you, about half of it is on this half, um, is on the left half of the rod, half of it's on the right, a, you know, a fourth of the length has a fourth of the charge. Uh, in those cases, we call it, we call the charge uniformly distributed, by the way. Uh, and it's continuously distributed. Right? It's a continuous charge distribution in that case. So in that case, what we would have to do if we want to know the electric field at point P, we have to split the rod up into a bunch of little pieces of charge and then basically do KQ over R squared. And instead of a sum, it becomes an integral. So we're going to replace that sum with saying that the total electric field uh, at point P uh, is going to be an integral by the way, there's an r hat right here too. I forgot, right? I put a vector and then is equal to a number on the right, which is bad. Uh, so, so the way we have to think about it, and this is actually the first time you really, well, maybe depending on what you did in for in physics 2A, this is the first time you really have to be like clever about creating calculus problems. You, you've been trained in math classes to solve integrals if you're given the integral, but it, what makes these sections kind of hard is that you have to come up with the integral. Um, so we have to think about, so what happens if we look at a little piece of rod? We want to look at a piece of rod that's so tiny that it has a well-defined distance away from that point. Right? And we talk about infinitesimals in math. So if you shrink down an a infinitesimal piece of the rod, you're going to have an infinitesimal amount of charge. But the distance is still well-defined. So we're not shrinking down R to infinitely small. We're shrinking the, the piece of rod infinitely small. And the charge on it is going to be infinitely small, but the distance from the charge to the point is not infinitely small. So the contribution to that piece, so we're going to integrate over a little contributions DE vector. The contribution, so DE is the contribution to the electric field at point P due to DQ. So this is the same as always. It's K DQ over R squared. And we still have the R hat, the pesky R hat thing. And we're going to integrate over the whole like rod, for example, in this case. But we're going to generalize this and talk about 2D problems as well. Um, so at this point, we're kind of stuck, right? How do you do an integral dq? This is something you never talked about in math class. You talked about integrating over coordinates, but you didn't talk about integrating over such abstract things. So, so really, the problem is right here. How do we make this a tractable thing? And that's exactly why we need these charge densities, OK? So what this charge density will allow us to do is turn the dq into something we can actually integrate over. So um, lambda is really going to be the amount of charge per unit length of the rod um, anywhere on the rod. Uh, and because the rod is uniformly charged, we can take the total charge of the rod divided by the total length of the rod. So I'm imagining that capital Q is given and capital L, the length of the rod, is given. So in this case, uh, what this is saying is that the amount of charge in any little piece of the rod is going to be this constant times the little piece of length of the rod. 
And like if you orient your coordinate system so that this is the x axis, x direction, this could be lambda dx. Maybe it's dy if you oriented it a different way. But um, this looks like something we could actually integrate over, right? So lambda, the linear charge density, is going to be this thing that lets us turn the dq in this integral into dx, something we can actually integrate over. And then all this is is the two-dimensional version of that. Like eta will be will let us turn dqs into integrals over areas, dAs. So this is the gist of it. And once you understand this part, the, the rest of it is just kind of math. So so setting up these problems is the hardest part of it. Um, so that's what your book basically goes over and, and talks about this. Divide the charge into a bunch of little charges. Use our knowledge of the electric field of a point charge to uh, to find the electric field of each q. So, so what that means is to dE equals some function times dQ. So, so what your book means by number two is introduce a coordinate system to make this make sense. So you remember the remember this what I did right here. I kind of I had to introduce this x direction to introduce this thing. Like it, it's not quite so obvious, you know. And you're there's a lot of freedom in, in how you set it up. Um, but once you set it up and introduce the charge density in that number two, uh, numbers two and three, then then so then what you want to do is like lambda dx, uh, and then actually perform the integral. So then you can integrate dE to get the total e. E is the integral of it, I think, times lambda dx. So your book does an example of this uh, right here. So they do a sum over dQ. Uh, if you want, you could do the sum first and then turn it into an integral. I'll, I would just write the integral right away. I don't think you have to do the delta and then turn it into d. Um, but if it helps, then then that's fine too. Otherwise, you can just kind of, you know, it, it just this is really the starting point. But there's a lot of ingredients that go here. Like this q over l is really the lambda, and lambda dy was a dq. So so there were a lot, jumping straight into here might be a little too big of a step. But they could have just written written down an integral line here. Um, the vectors are still important. So if you do a, a question like this. You know, really, there's a separate dEx and dEy. So if I look at a little piece of charge dQ right here, this is going to be dE right here, the total amount of dE. But really, all we care about because of the symmetry of the problem is dEx. So dEx is dE times cosine of this angle right here, this angle theta right here. And we're going to use x. So x is the distance like from the rod to the point of interest. So we know we're going to use x. We're probably going to turn cosine theta into x divided by uh, r, or x divided by square root of x squared plus y squared. Here. So uh, another complication, in addition to, to having integrals here, is also uh, making sure that we're, being, we're taking into account the fact that we have vectors, and all we care about is certain components in symmetrical cases or you know separately we have to do the x and y component separately um, so any one piece of these examples is not all that crazy it's just that we have to keep track of a lot of things all at the same time uh, that's what makes these sections hard so your book takes your results takes the example question result and then uh takes a limit takes a certain limit takes the limit as the uh, line of charge gets infinitely long uh, and in that case the answer simplifies quite a bit and this is one of those main results at the beginning of the chapter. So the electric field due to an infinite line, here it just says line, but really it's an infinite line. Uh, e due to, an, due to an infinite line is k lambda uh, over 2k lambda over r, the distance from the rod. So it's not a distance from like here to here. It's just distance straight to the rod. Um, so this is inversely proportional to r, not r squared, because of all those separate contributions. If we just had a single charge right here and wanted to know the electric field here, it would depend on the square of the, or inversely proportional to the square of this distance. But because of all these contributions, it winds up being a one over r dependence, um, which is sort of special here. And there will be a, 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 a different result for a 2D case, which is even more surprising. Um, so. Uh, one consequence of this is like if you whatever the electric field here here is here it's half as big, 
right? If you double the distance, the electric field is going to be half as big. So you can see the electric field uh, lines are getting weaker and weaker here. Um, yeah. The next section sort of builds on this idea and runs with it. Um, so this first example um, hopefully can, can convince you that uh, not every one of these problems are terribly complicated. So, so what happens here is that uh, every little piece of charge actually has the same uh, electric field contribution. And so when you do this integral, it's like a trivial integral. Basically, you set up an integral, and the inter integrand all comes out. And then you do integral dq, and then you just get q. So actually, you don't even have to build up. You don't even have to define a charge density for, the, for this one. But you do have to be careful about direction. Right? This piece dq points in this direction, uh, but you only want the piece that is along the axis of symmetry. So that's where that cosine theta comes from. And, uh, so, and that's that's also why the answer isn't just kq over r squared, right? You have to be a little, little careful. But but beyond that, it's it's not so bad. Um, so so that problem is the electric field of a ring of charge. So we're actually going to use this result and consider a disk of charge as a bunch of rings. So if you look at this like solid disk of charge, you can consider it as a bunch of rings of radius dr and uh, I'm sorry, of thickness dr and radius r. So each one of those rings is going to contribute to the electric field here. And you, you have to sum up all those rings to get the whole disk. So in other words, like when we did a, a line charge, we took a bunch of points and we integrated over all those points to get the whole rod, right? Integral, like we integrated over a zero dimensional object, the points to get a rod. And then now we're going to integrate 1D rings to get the 2D disk, the electric field due to a disk. Um, so, so this section is just describing how to do that. And for that, we would need a two dimensional charge density, so charge per unit area. And in particular for this disk, we, we say that the area is pi r squared. And it's uniformly distributed, so it's just the total charge divided by the total area of the disk. Eta is a constant. Uh, so it's easier than it otherwise would be. Um, so we take a ring. So, so it, if, if this whole thing has some charge q and we take a tiny sliver of it right, for the ring of radius dr, then it's only going to have a tiny fraction of the total charge. So whereas for this problem, this Q is like the whole charge of the whole ring. In this problem, the, the charge of the ring is going to be an infinitesimal quantity, dQ. So it's sort of weird because we're going to take the result here, copy it down over for the next section, but replace the Q with a dQ because it's, it's an infinitesimal amount of charge. And the hard part is turning that dQ into, uh, into something we, need, we can integrate over. So that trick is going to be dQ is eta times dA. And the area of each one of those rings is, and your book tries to visualize this right here, um, it's the circumference times the thickness dr. Because like if you if you imagine that ring, you could imagine you, you, you took some scissors and you sliced it and then you laid it all out. It's going to be the circumference times dr. It, it's basically like a, a, a rectangle there. Uh, so the circumference would be 2 pi r and then the thickness dr. So you take the result from that example problem, you replace the q with dq. And then you replace the dq with this. And then now it's actually something you can iterate over. The so lowercase r is going to go from 0 to capital R. And then you get the electric field of a disk, which is this. The disk has some radius capital R, but you can take that radius all the way to infinitely big, or equivalently, take the z down to 0 to get what the electric field is when you're very, very close to a disk. Or, or in other words, it's the infinite plane of charge. Right? There's a couple of ways of turning this result into an infinite plane of charge. Make, imagine the disk gets infinitely big, or you just get super close to the disk. Um, so in that limit, the, the result is extremely easy. It's just eta over 2 epsilon, constant. So this is what's really surprising. You have a disk, the electric field here, and the electric field here. You know, Even though we might be twice as far away from the disk, it's about the same. You know, it's the same to the extent that this is like an infinite disk. So the bigger this is, the better the approximation that is. Uh, and this is the value of that constant. Uh, it depends on the charge density, so how concentrated are the charges are. And that's all it depends on. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, 
So your book, you know, just reminds you that the, the sign of the charge is important. So the electric field points away from positive planes and, and towards negative planes, but otherwise it's, it's, it's pretty simple. The last thing is a result that we're not going to prove because it's, it's sort of the same stuff, but then going from 2D to 3D. Um, and it's just more of the same. But here's the main result. Um, so we've been talking about points of charge and saying the electric field is KQ over R squared. What's amazing is that if you have, instead of a point charge, if you had a whole sphere of some finite radius and the charge is spread out evenly over that sphere, um, the electric field outside of that sphere is the same as if all that charge were located at the very center of the sphere. Um, so it's an amazing approximation. Like, and it, and it looks, it's basically like the same equation over again, right? KQ over R squared. But it's saying something else. It's saying that if, if you have charge spread out over a sphere, it acts as though all that charge were at the center. Um, so it, it takes some work to actually prove this. And we're going to uh, talk about our proof when we talk about Gauss's law next chapter. Um, and then finally, the, this next section just kind of applies the infinite. So, so forget the sphere thing, but looking at this, if you have two sheets of, of charge uh, that are so close together that they look infinitely big, like if you're at a point inside, then the distance is so small that you know you're close enough to these disks uh, or plates that, that they, they, they're, I'm calling them infinite, but really they're just spaced really, really close together. Uh, if that's the case, then you basically have like two infinite planes and the electric field contributions will add up inside. If these are equal and opposite charges on the plate to the what's called a capacitor, the electric field charges, the electric field contributions of the two plates add together uh, inside and then they cancel on the outside. So a capacitor is an object, it's a, it's a charged object that has a very approximately uniform electric field on the inside and zero on the outside. And this this is the ideal case, and this is what it actually is. Um, and the, the electric field is eta over epsilon naught, because there's two contributions of eta over two epsilon naught, and they add together. All right, uh, so this example problem. Uh, a uniformly charged disk of charge density eta and radius r, but we're going to imagine that the disk is halved uh, and the charge remains constant. So disk is halved, but it's isolated. It's not, it doesn't mention that it's hooked up to anything like a battery to get charge or anything. So we have to remember that charge is conserved. And so if the disk is halved, it has, it has the same overall charge. So the charge density is the total charge divided by the radius. Um, oops. So remember charge per unit length was lambda, but eta, the charge here is spread out over a two-dimensional surface. So this is charge per unit area. So charge divided by pi r squared. So we'll imagine this was the original eta, eta naught, the original radius, and the original charge, which is just q. That's not going to change. And then the new eta is going to be the, the charge, which just doesn't change, over the new area, or pi times. And the new radius is going to be half as big. Uh, or let's just call it, keep calling this R. So if the radius is half as big, it looks like the new eta is four times bigger than the original eta. So charge in a density increases by a factor of four. Eta increases by a factor of four, and that means that the electric field increases by a factor of four. Because remember, the electric field was just eta over two epsilon naught. And here it looks like the looks like based on this picture, the charge density is positive if the electric field is pointing away. All right, that was an easy problem.